All right, welcome to Ponch Church this morning. Have you ever heard a conversation uh, kind of over here, a conversation that you'd really rather not hear? Have you ever been in that atmosphere where, yes. you know, it seems like that's pretty common nowadays with everybody talking on their phone, but you know, a lot of times if you're in a public place or uh, if you're, uh, uh, like, I'll, I'll work at Starbucks a lot, and so the, the roar never bothers me, but if there's just one person kind of dominating the room, then it's like, you know, you'd, you'd prefer not to hear every, every little thing. Well, the other day, uh, Nina and I were walking. I don't even remember where we were, honey, but we were walking, and two young guys passed us. They were probably about, I don't know, maybe about 30 years old, and they were dressed nice, you know, decently, and had nice shoes on, and, and fit guys, and they were talking, and and we, we laughed later, but we said, you know, they probably had a $1,000 cell phone in their pocket and $200 shoes and probably going to their $30,000 car. And, and none, of that, none of that matters except for what we heard them say. And this is all we heard because they, they were just passing us. And they, they go by us, and all we heard them say was, was MF rich people. That's what they said. <laughs> but they spelled out the word. So we're not going to use that no, word today. Gonna I'm going to use dang. Everybody say dang. dang. I'm going to use dang. <laughs> but that's what they said. They're walking by. And they and that's all the, we heard four words. And that's all we heard. And, 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 and I'm going to interpret that today to be dang rich people. And that's all. And, and we got about two steps past them. And Nina said, what did they just say? And, and, and we both just started laughing because we understand what that means is we know people that all they have is the shirt on their back. And to that group, those two guys were the dang rich people, right? They were the dang yeah, ones. And, and so it, statistics tell us that six out of the seven billion people on the earth, that those two guys who were walking by, those two guys are actually uh, better off than about 6.93 billion of the rest of the world. They're the 70 million, they're part of the 70 million, uh, but of course in this 70 million group, who's ever got more is the dang rich person. But just for, just for uh, uh, clarity and, and lack of misunderstanding, I have always considered, since I've been a young Christian as a, as a young man, I've always considered myself, I never called myself that, but I've always considered myself a dang rich person. I just did. I started reading the scriptures, and, and Jesus was like, man, I've come to give you abundant life. And man, from that point on, I just felt that that was God's will. God's will is abundance. And then I look, and then I start going to work for this guy. And I, and I worked for him, and here's a guy. I read stories about him, and this guy knew how, listen to this, this guy knew how to take thanksgiving for what he had and turn it into 15,000 lunches. Thanksgiving for five loaves and two fish. This guy lived in abundance, and I saw that in his life. So I've always considered myself one of these dang rich people that <laughs> our two buddies were talking about, you know. I almost said, hey, I'm one of those guys. I, I want to be counted as one of those guys. I promise that you might have the life and have it more abundant. But as we said last week, we said that... Uh, 20 years ago, God had given me a message to the Christian church in America, the, the American church. And today, I'm going to basically talk about that same message to the American Christian. Last week, we talked about the church. Uh, you see my little uh, see my little church over there? Uh, I, I built that. Uh, anyway, we, we talked about the American church. And today, we want to talk about the American Christian. And so the American Christian, when I think of the American Christian... I think that we're all here, all of us here in America, that we're part of this uh, dang rich people uh, part, you know. And uh, <clears throat> and so Jesus had some, he had some advice for us. He not only put us here in America, but he also gave us some advice on how to live here. Now, had you been born in a hut in Africa, he would have some advice for you there. Had you been born in the persecuted church in China, he would have some advice for you there. Have you, had you been born in America, he will have some advice for us here. Advice, everybody say advice. Advice. 
advice. advice. Jesus has advice. He's actually a, a financial planner, a money manager, you know. He's an advisor to us rich people. And he's going to give us some tips. I would call them a little more than tips, but he's going to give us some tips. And listen, listen, folks, you will not hear these anywhere else except in the Bible. That's the only place you hear them. The Bible's the only book that will record these tips for you, the ones that Jesus gave us. Planners won't tell you, brokers, agents, not even Warren Buffett. What if, now, what kind of church service would we have today? Would everybody tweet this out? If Warren Buffett walked in today <laughs> and said, he's still alive, right? He's real old. <laughs> he's still kicking though, I think. But if he walked in today and said, I have the best tip of my life, would you, would, you'd have to listen to him, right? Wouldn't it? I'd be like, okay, well, sure, so share with us. Well, Warren Buffett is nothing compared to this guy who with Thanksgiving created 15,000 lunches. Warren Buffett doesn't know that. He doesn't have those ideas. <laughs> he can't give us a clue about that. So when I'm talking about money tips, I'm talking about coming from a guy that's, he's in a class of his own. There's no one even close to him <clears throat> as a financial advisor. All right, so let's look and see what Jesus told us, us in America, the American Christian. Matthew 6, 19, don't store treasures here on earth. And this is right from the beginning, you know. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, I believe, is put in the Bible as one of Jesus' only full sermons. It's put in the Bible because I believe that everywhere he went, he taught this. He taught these same principles to every audience. That's why it's, that's why it's in the book. It's like, here's, here's what Jesus taught us. So he says, don't store treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store up your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever, and, this, and then he tells us why, uh, wherever your treasure is stored up, there your heart will be also. Wherever your treasure is, King James says, there your heart will be also. So Jesus gives us some advice, advice to the American Christian. Matthew uh, 6.22, he goes on to, to say, uh, in the, in, I took the other verse out, it just says the light of the body is the eye, and there's some stuff in there, but it, it's too much to get into. But he's still talking about the same thing, verse 22, no man can serve two masters, for you will hate the one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or treasure. So his advice was lay up treasure in what? Heaven. Heaven. That was his advice. You don't get that advice anywhere else in the world. Call every financial planner you know, every guru you know, and just talk to them. What would you think I should do with, with my money? And just... Wait on the phone and stay on the phone until he gets to, oh, by the way, lay up your treasure in heaven. You're going to be on the phone a long time, right? <laughs> it's, just, it's just not part of it. This is what Jesus said to do. Lay up your treasure in heaven. So let's ask ourselves some questions about that verse, about that advice. How many masters does Jesus, I'm going to give you a hint. How many masters does Jesus say there are? No man can serve, how many? Two. two. No man can serve two masters. So he's talking about two masters in life. No man can serve two. And what are the, or who are the masters? He says, God and money. Or we could also say God and self. Self and money kind of go hand in hand. <laughs> God and self. God and mammon. God and money. And the reason we like money is because it's good for self. So it, it, it's all in, in her, uh, twined in there. How many of these masters can be served at one time? One at a time, right? You're either serving God or you are not. See, Jesus, Jesus' advice is so clear. This is this is why nobody uh, nobody wants to give it because it's so clear. We either serve God or we're not. We're either serving God or we're serving self. There's, there's only two. Well, 
let's just say we all start out serving self and serving money. Jesus said there's only two masters. We all start out serving self, and protecting self, and doing whatever is good for self, and, 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 you know, everything's about self. And when I say self, me and my home. When do we stop? If I start out serving self, when do I stop? Any ideas? If I start out in life serving self, what's, when's the day that I stop serving self and stop serving money? What day is that? Any ideas? On the day you die? Mm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> when we start serving others. When you start serving others, or what did Jesus say? Lay up treasure in what? Heaven. Heaven. And you can only do one or the other. So let me try again. When do I stop serving self? When I lay up treasure in heaven. That's the only time. There's only two. <laughs> we're, we're either serving. We're either serving self, which is normal. We all start out that way. If you ever seen, you know, we have little grandbabies. Mm -hmm. He's never asked me how I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Only thing running through his mind is, what can you give me? Yeah. What can you do for me? Yeah. I don't blame him for that. I still love him, right? I'm like, oh, isn't that cute? He's all about himself. <laughs> so cute, and you tickle his little cheeks. It's so cute. But if my 30-year-old son, if that's all he's thinking about, I have to slap him around a bit. <laughs> Let me ask you this then, based on what Jesus, his real simple words, lay up treasure in heaven. His real simple words, no man can serve two masters. You'll either love the one or hate the other. You just can't do both at the same time. You can't stop serving self until you lay up treasure in heaven. You just can't. So if I ask that question, in your thinking, in your mind, can you serve Jesus without laying up treasure in heaven? Are you, is it possible? Can you say you're serving Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We can say anything we want, right? <laughs> We can even get a bunch of group a group of people together with us and all believe it. But according to these simple words, can we? Who calls the office every Sunday morning? I have no idea. <laughs> it's that group of atheists in town. You know? <laughs> can, can we serve Jesus without? You cannot serve God and self. You just can't do it. You can't serve God and self, God and money, God and mammon. You just can't do it. And we are serving self until we lay up treasure in heaven. So can we serve Jesus without laying up treasure in heaven? Remember what else he said? For where your treasure is, there will your what? Heart be. I'm offering you today the best financial advice you've ever heard in your life, better than Warren Buffett, better than any guru out there. And it's the simple truth of lay up treasure. I know this guy, folks. He knows what he's talking about. I mean, man, this guy. He took some guys fishing and he toiled all night and hadn't taken anything. You, you'd like to learn how to do this, Brian. He's a fisherman. Mm -hmm. Professional fisherman, two boats full, nothing. Toiled all night, fished all night, didn't get, catch anything. Jesus said, Let's go fishing. <laughs> Nevertheless, at your word, we'll let down the nets. We'll go. They didn't want to go, they just were being nice to Jesus. They went out there and he said, Okay, right here, let down your net. And what happened? Two boats full of fish. I'm talking about a guy who knows how this system works. He knows everything about it. And what, what, what happened to them? They were amazed. You remember what Peter did? He fell on his knees. He said, get away from me. I'm too sinful for you to even be by. 
because Peter saw something. Peter said, man, this guy knows something that we don't know. He can do stuff that we can't do. I'm going to listen to him. <laughs> I'm not worthy to listen to him. So ask yourself, who are you serving? You can only serve one. Paul confirmed this idea. Look what Paul said about laying up treasure in heaven. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Teach those who are rich, dang rich people. Let's all say it together. Dang rich people. That's me. Teach, teach rich those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. That's the God we serve. He just That's just who he is, folks. You got five loaves, two fish? Great, let's thank God for it. You got two boats empty? Great, let's thank God and fill those boats up. He says, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous specifically to those in need, always being ready to share with others. We're talking about laying up treasure in heaven. By doing this, what? This what? By laying up your treasure in heaven, by doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience. Notice, they're, they're storing up for the future, but they're experiencing true life here. That's a pretty good deal. Now look what Jesus said. So Paul confirmed that laying up treasure in heaven stuff. Now look what Jesus said in John 14, 23. Jesus replied, he's talking to his disciples. All who love me will what? Do what I say. Isn't that interesting? All who love me will do what I say. Who can think of a phrase that Jesus told us, the American church, to do? Anybody? Starts with lay. Ends with heaven. Lay of treasures. If you love me, you're going to do what I say. Now, religion doesn't say this, folks. Religion just says, do the best you can, be the best you can, be the best person you can. Jesus said, I'm not, I'm not falling for that. Jesus said, you're either laying up treasure in heaven or you're serving yourself. That's just the truth. It is. I can't help it nobody tell me the truth, but that's the truth. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. So my question is, if I just refuse or choose not to or ignore if I do not for whatever reason lay up my treasure in heaven my question is do I love him is that is that available do I even believe in him is he my financial advisor guru or am I still in the Warren Buffett lane do I believe him if I don't do what he says I don't know seems to be where our generation is. You can believe them, but you don't have to obey them. I don't, I don't see that gospel. <laughs> I don't see that in the book anywhere. All right, let's move along. Here's how you do it. Very simple. I, do, I, I teach some simple stuff, and this is as simple as it gets. You want to lay up treasure in heaven? You want to start today? For every 10 coins you get, these could be 10 pennies. Could be 10 million, doesn't matter. For every 10 you get, this is this is simple math. For every 10 you get, one tenth of it, a tenth. And when I say lay up treasure in heaven, I'm talking about a tenth, a 10% of your income, salary, savings, property, stocks, investments, net worth, nest egg. I don't care if God has given it to you. Now, if you've stolen it, you probably should give it back. But if God has given it to you, a tenth belongs to him. And in a perfect world, you're supposed to be able to bring it to the church. But I don't recommend bringing it to the church because the church will steal it. So in a perfect world, you bring it to the church. And 100% of this tenth, 100% of it, is to go to the poor. 
a tenth brought to God, given to the poor. That's laying up treasure in heaven. Isn't that what Paul said? Be rich in good works, generous to those in need. It was always to the poor. Of course, what have we chosen to do with it? See my nice little building blocks over there? That's what we've chosen to do with it. We've given him all kinds, of, honored him with all kinds of buildings. Of course, he never asked us to, but, you know, minor things. 100% of it goes to the priest who's considered part of the poor. That's just the way God does it. In the Old Testament, the, the tribe of Levi, Levi, the Levites, had no inheritance in God. And if the other 11 tribes didn't take care of the tribe of Levi, they had nothing. So part of the poor is the priest, the widow, the fatherless, the stranger, or the poor stranger. That's who it's supposed to go to. I'm talking about laying up treasure in heaven. I'm talking about financial advice that no one on earth will give you except the Bible. Everyone else thinks it's nonsense. Now, this tenth is for the poor. It's not for me to keep. It's not for my security. It's not for my nest egg. It's for the poor. It's always been designated for the poor. It's not for Jesus. The modern church in America don't get this. It's not for Jesus. He's okay. <laughs> his people are suffering. It's not for Jesus. It's not for his honor or his glory or his ministry. That's not what this tenth is for. It's for the poor. 100% of it is for the poor. Well, that means... Listen, dang rich people who I consider myself, that means I get to keep 90. All right. What a deal. 90 and heaven? You'd rather have 100 and no heaven? But see, religion comes along and says, no, 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 don't worry about that. You don't have to obey Jesus. You don't have to do what he says. You know, look the other way. <laughs> don't pay attention to that wizard behind the curtain. Religion says, no, 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 you don't have to. You don't have to listen. Actually, you'll listen to what he says and actually do it. Lay up treasure in heaven. Nobody does that. People will think you're nuts if you do that. Jesus said, hey, you get to keep the 90. That's a deal. Now, you're free to give more of that if you want to. Zacchaeus gave 50%. But that's what it's for. And that's how we lay up treasure in heaven. Look at the Acts Church, the book of Acts, uh, modeling this for us. Acts 4.34, there were no needy people among them. It's talking about the very early church, just started, Jesus resurrected, 40 days and nights. He'd been teaching people the truth, and he'd been teaching how to lay up treasure in heaven. There were no needed people among them because those who own land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles and give to what? Those in need. You'll not find one building in the New Testament. Not one building in the book of Acts. Not one house built for God's glory or honor, you will repeatedly find the only use of money, this first tenth anyway, you can take additional offerings to do other projects and things, but this first tenth, it's holy, it's set apart from by God for the poor. And, there, and this first church, they got it. And bring the money to the apostles and give to those in need. This is the way the church started. Verse 36, for instance, there was Joseph, the one of the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, who means son of encouragement. Uh, he was from the tribe of Levi and he came from the island of Cyprus. He sold the field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. 
In other words, I just gave an example. Of course, we know Barnabas went on to do amazing things in the book of Acts. Yes. The only expense ever mentioned, stay with me, we're almost done. The only expense ever mentioned in the New Testament of money brought to the church is those in need. It's the only one. You will not find anything else. Priest, widow, fatherless, and the poor stranger. So are they used for it? Not for that first 10%. But all we see is blocks for Jesus. <laughs> you know. But in the Acts church, we don't see one block. Not one block given to Jesus. Created, built, made. All were laying up treasure in heaven. First 10 of our treasure for the poor. Well, Paul confirmed this. Look at Paul, Acts 20, 26. This is at the end of Paul's ministry. He's heading to Rome. He knows it's going to be his last trip. He's saying goodbye to all the churches. Here he's called the leaders of Ephesus to him. Towards the end of his ministry, he knew it was over. And look what he says. Acts 20, 26. I normally don't read this uh, whole story like this, but I wanted to today, so bear with me. Paul says, I declare today that I've been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. Man, that jumped out of me. He says, you know what? I've been telling people the truth. And Paul said, it's not my fault. If you don't follow it. I'm, I, I haven't told you what you wanted to hear or what would make me popular. I just told you the truth. And if you reject it, it's not on me. Man, when you get to be my age, you got to take those verses serious, you know. It's like, man, I've been speaking for Jesus for over 25 years of my life. I've been <laughs> speaking for him. And so these last few years, it's like, i got to tell people the truth. <laughs> I gotta tell him the truth. Paul felt a weight on his shoulders. He said, he said, man, if I don't tell these people the truth, they could miss eternal life because of something I told them. He was taking this really serious. He said, but I, I, I'm convinced in my heart that I've told you the truth. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. For I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Guard yourselves and God's people. He's talking to the leaders. And he said, feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. I know, look what he's going to say. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave. He knew he was leaving. Man, Paul was something else. When he was alive, he said, I'm keeping the church in line. <laughs> they are not going to leave the truth as long as I'm standing on this earth. I am going to declare the truth. He said, but I'm leaving. My work here is over. And God has shown me that when the truth, when the voices of the truth leave, wolves come in. After I leave, now, wolves will come in, vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Look at that. I'm telling you, folks, I know how to do that. I've done it. I can teach the Bible. I can tell people what they want to hear. And people will come. And all you got to do is just distort it a little bit. Just do the best you can. You don't have to lay up treasure in heaven. Just, just be a good person. Oh, they'll flock to that. Verse 31, watch out. Remember, look how serious Paul was here. I mean, I feel like I'm kind of serious today, and I'm trying to keep it light. But I, I look like a romper room kid compared to him. Look at what he says here. Remember, 
the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you day and night, and my many tears for you. What if we started this Sunday? And I just, you just come in and I just cried every Sunday, just cried, oh, please, listen to the Lord, you know. And three years later, you come back and visit. And that's all I'm doing, just crying, oh, listen to the Lord. He was, he was wild. He took this stuff serious. He said, man, I don't want anybody missing God because of something I've said. Many years, many tears. So let's ask ourselves, he seems serious to me. What's so important to him? What's the church gonna lose sight of? Well, they certainly didn't lose sight of build God a bunch of buildings. They didn't lose sight of that little doctrine, right? We got, especially the church in America, we got that doctrine. Of course, it's not in the Bible, but we got that doctrine. It's not in the New Testament, I should say. And again, there's nothing wrong with buildings or temples and meeting places. It just shouldn't be provided for from the first tent. That's all. What's the church going to lose sight of? What's so important? What did the church lose sight of? I'm going to give you a hint. It starts with lay and it ends with heaven. I'm submitting to you that what they lost was laying up treasure in heaven. Why did they lose that? Because it's more popular to just say, do the best you can. We'll distort it a little bit. Oh, keep Jesus. You know, we keep him. He's popular. That's good. But not all his words. Some of his words are a little troubling to the nice folks. Well, let's see what he said. He continues, verse 32. And now I entrust you to God and to the message of his grace that's able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he set apart for himself. I, and, then, and then look at this. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes, you know, that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs. Paul was a tent maker by trade. He was a traveling minister tent maker. And he would go into areas where there was no churches and no gospel had ever been preached. And he would not charge people <laughs> to become Christians. And so God gave him this, this uh, uh, ability uh, to provide for himself and even the needs of those who were with me. So this is, this is how God worked with with Paul in his traveling minister ministry to to unreached people groups. Acts 20 35. And here it is. I have been a constant example. He's talking to people that have observed his life, his Christian life. He's at the end of it. He's talking to the leaders in Ephesus. He said, I've been a constant example. Not every once in a while. I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's what the church was going to lose sight of when Paul was gone. What? Here it is, folks. Not rocket science. Work hard. Give to the poor. Church is not going to. They're not going to like that after I'm gone. They're going to come in and distort that. Lay up treasure generous to those in need. Work hard and help those in need. That's what this tent is for. It's more blessed to give than to receive. It's the only expense mentioned in the New Testament, folks. It just is. Jesus said, if you love me, do what I say. Now, I'm just going to share a quick testimony. Somebody, this happened a couple years ago when our book first came out. Somebody read our book and actually believed it. I about fell over, but somebody actually read it and believed it. And they literally start doing it. At the time, they had a good job, and they start just giving 10% to the poor. That's what they did. They said, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to look at everything I have. I'm going to give a tenth to the poor. And they went from a good job. All of a sudden, an opportunity opened up for them to own the company. They bought the company. They were just, oh, they just had a good job. 
decided to, to lay up treasure in heaven. And today that company's thriving. They've, they've expanded, increased, and basically not perfect people just gave a tent to the poor. Ten percent to the poor. Jesus said, do not store up treasure on earth. Store up your treasure in heaven. And this will open a life that you do not even, uh, you can't even dream of. Me and you working together. Wait till I show you what I can do. You know, wait till I show you what I do with five loaves and two fish. Wait till I show you what I do with two empty boats. Man, I can, I can do some, some, some things with people who will listen to me. Amen? Amen. I think you got something. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, while he was sharing um, that little structure over there that he built with my grandchildren's little building block, I love that. But the one thing that I was thinking about at the, at the end, and I can always tell when the Holy Spirit's moving because my heart will be plop, you know, just pounding out of my chest. That's, a, that's just kind of annoying that I'm supposed to share what I believe he's told me to share. But anyways, um, I remember attending churches where they would pray and they would, they would pass baskets around and they would pass a basket around and preach give your tents so we can build our ministries in our church. And they pass the basket. My husband decided years ago, we don't pass the basket. You want to obey God, you just obey God. And so I'm sitting there, and I know you've all received emails from me regarding Ponce Village Homeless Women Housing. But if you'll remember what Rick taught today, the money is to go to build buildings for people in a sense. We have a house, legacy housing for age out foster girls. We want to purchase that property. It's $150,000. It's not a lot of money. It's just not. I want to put duplexes because they won't allow tiny homes because tiny homes are not allowed in Volusia because of hurricanes. That may if be we changing. could, I could do. That may be changing by the way. Oh, that might be changing. Okay. That's good news. But still, what he taught today, we can do today. We can take our tent from the year, for every week from in here and in in out, from now and till we purchase that property. Uh, we had two women, I like to share this story because it's the truth. Two women that helped us buy Legacy House. They were two women, say two women. Two women. Okay, one. they were both sisters. One gave her first, I think the first 20 or 30,000. And then another woman, uh, her sister later gave another, I think it was 20, could, could have been more. And then the second woman and her husband who has, a, who has their own company organization bought the actual house a few years later or like two years later. So I know it's possible. And I know I'm passionate about it. Our, our church also gave them and over church, 20, and probably 25,000. I'm just trying to make a point here. It started with two women. Two women hearing the Holy Spirit. Two women listening to God, obeying Jesus' words. Could they have went and bought other things for themselves and their family with that money? Absolutely. There's always something we can buy. You can leave here today and you can go spend 20 grand on something. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm asking you, and I'm going to pray. And the reason I'm going to pray, and for Facebook too, is I was sitting in a church service years ago, years ago, and the missionary preacher's up there praying, and he's getting ready to take a team to Mexico to go minister to the poor there and build a Christian school in Mexico. And he's praying, and I'm, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not a missionary. I'm not going on a mission trip. So Jesus spoke to my heart. And when he prayed, when he prayed, Jesus spoke to my heart and he said, I want you to go. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. Because I didn't want to go. And I was able to minister to the ladies. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that we just need to listen to the word of God 
We need to not listen to our neighbors, our friends, or even our spouses. We need to listen to what is Jesus, what is the Holy Spirit telling us. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask God, anybody in this room or in the sound of my voice on Facebook, to listen to Jesus. Be a part of this team, and let's lay up our treasure in heaven, and let's get this property. It's 150000 It's not a million dollars. We can do this. I'm going to do this until I get this money. Whether it's through email or I come up every once in a while on a Sunday morning, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. So let's just pray. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. These are not my words. I know these are words by the Holy Spirit, the Holy God himself. To lay up treasure in heaven, to help the poor, to help those in need, to show mercy to show compassion. Just as Jesus said about the Good Samaritan, he said, go and do the same. Father, I ask you to give anyone in the sound of my voice the wisdom on how they can manage it and how they will manage it to give so that we can buy this property. I ask you to speak through their hearts directly, whether it's this morning, driving in their car, sitting at home, taking a shower, getting ready in the bathroom. You can speak anywhere, and I know this because you speak to me all the time. Father, I ask that you speak to them and they know exactly what they're to give. You tell them, you give them a number so that we can glorify you in the earth by helping these homeless women and homeless women with their children I ask you for it, and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Facebook. And uh, we receive our offering.